Back then, my dream was to go to the USC Medical School, get married, raise a family, and practice medicine in Los Angeles. Growing up in a lower middle class community on the south side of Chicago, medicine was considered the pinnacle of, of professions, noble and humane. Virtually everyone important in my life, my family, my teachers, my girlfriend, wanted me to be a doctor. Over time, their dreams became my dreams. They convinced me I should be a doctor, but as hard as I tried, I couldn't do it. After a few difficult and unhappy years as a pre-med student, it became painfully clear to me that I did not like the courses I was taking. I thought my comparative anatomy class was a perversely pointless form of psychological torture, especially the dissection labs, and I just could not make myself study something that didn't interest me. At the time, I thought I lacked discipline and that I was selfish. Maybe so. But whatever the underlying reasons, I was unable to make myself into the person that I thought I should be. So I decided to stop trying. I was 21 years old when I dropped out of college, packed everything I owned, jeans, t-shirts, leather jacket, guitar, into my car and drove from Chicago to Berkeley, California. Berkeley in the 1960s was at the center of everything. The anti-war movement, the free speech movement, the human rights movement. It was the perfect place for an undisciplined, selfish 20-something to begin his search for himself, a righteous cause, and a job that he loved. Everyone living in Berkeley in the 1960s opposed the Vietnam War. I was no different. It was the age of Aquarius, but I never had long hair, and I never wore love beads. I learned to play popular protest songs on my guitar, but I was never a committed, serious, anti-war protester. I did find a cause, however, one I still feel passionately about today. A few hours east of Berkeley are the Sierra Nevada Mountains. I fell in love with those mountains and the ineffable, natural beauty of Yosemite Valley. I cared about the wilderness, and I wanted to help preserve it. I joined the Sierra Club. I became an environmentalist. During my California springs and summers, I spent most of my days in the high Sierras in Yosemite Valley, working as a river guide and a rock climbing instructor. I loved those jobs, but unfortunately, they didn't pay that well. So I also got a job working a couple of days a week as a computer programmer back in Berkeley. I had learned to program in college. I didn't love programming, but it was fun and I was good at it. And computer prog programming gave me the same kind of satisfaction as solving math problems and playing chess, both things I enjoyed before, before I became a confused teenager. At this point in my life, I thought I was making real progress on my journey of self-discovery. I had found a cause. I had a couple of jobs that I love, and one that was fun and paid the bills. I was pretty happy with my life. My wife was not. What she saw was a college dropout who spent too much time in the mountains doing foolish things. She wanted me to work full time as a computer programmer or go back to college and finish my degree. We compromised, sort of. I started taking classes at UC Berkeley. I took several classes, but the only one I can remember was a sailing class taught at Berkeley Marina. Once again, I fell in love and began a lifelong affair with the limitless, omnipotent Pacific Ocean. When my class was over, I wanted to buy a sailboat. My wife said this was the single stupidest idea she had ever heard in her entire life. She accused me of being irresponsible, and she told me I lacked ambition. She kicked me out, and then she divorced me. 
This was a pivotal moment in my life. My family was still mad at me for not going to medical school. And now my wife was divorcing me because I lacked ambition. It looked like a re reoccurrence of the same old problem. Once again, I was unable to live up to the expectations of others. But this time, I was not disappointed in myself for failing to be the person they thought I should be. Their dreams and my dreams were different. I would never confuse the two of them again. I had discovered things that I loved, the Sierras, Yosemite, the Pacific Ocean. These natural wonders brought me great joy and happiness and would for the rest of my life. I had an interesting job programming computers and more money than I needed. For the first time, I was certain that I was going to survive in this world. A huge burden of fear had been lifted. I'll never forget that moment. It was a time for rejoicing. I bought the sailboat and lived on board, just me and my cat in Berkeley Marina. In the words of James Joyce, I was alone and young and willful and unheeded, but I was happy and near to the wild heart of life. Throughout my 20s, I continued experimenting trying different things, racing bikes and boats and constantly changing jobs. It didn't take me long to discover that the most interesting and rewarding programming jobs were found at a cluster of companies located south of Stanford University and north of San Jose. Silicon Valley was in its infancy. I was still in my 20s when I went to work for my first Silicon Valley startup, Amdahl where we developed the world's fastest mainframe computer, faster than anything IBM had. Next stop was Ampex, where we built the world's largest digital data storage system. Then on to Precision Instruments, where we built an even larger data storage system, this time using lasers. I was the vice president in charge of software development. It was all very cutting edge and challenging and cool. I liked my work most of the time, but I didn't love it. I searched and I searched, but I just could not find a software engineering job that, that I loved as much as I loved sailing. So I tried to create one. I put together a plan to start my own company. That way I could completely control my work environment. I would hire the most talented programmers I knew, and we would all work together on the most interesting and challenging software projects. My goal was to create the perfect job for me, a job I truly loved. I never expected the company to grow beyond 50 people. So maybe I really did lack ambition or vision back then. I don't know. It was a long time ago, and I was very young. Anyway, today Oracle employs around 150,000 people. But when I started, it was not my intention to build a big company. What happened? Well, at first, we did exactly what we set out to do, hired the most talented software engineers in Silicon Valley. We assembled an all-star team of gifted programmers who were among the best in the world at what they did. That team, plus one crazy idea, gave birth to a giant company. I call it a crazy idea because at the time, everyone told me it was a crazy idea. The idea was to build the world's first relational database. Several theoretical papers about relational databases had already been published, and IBM was building a prototype in their research labs. But back then, the collective wisdom of computer experts was that while relational databases could be built, they would never be fast enough to be useful. I thought all those so-called computer experts were wrong. And when you start telling people that all the experts are wrong, at first they call you arrogant, and then they say you're crazy. So remember this, graduates. When people start telling you 
that you're crazy. You just might be on to the most important innovation in your life. Of course, the other possibility is <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> this is one of those times when the experts were wrong. Arrogance and insanity turned out to be innovation in disguise. The Oracle database proved to be a, a defining technology at the dawn of the information age. The Oracle database also totally upended my plans to build a small, comfortable company, a perfect place for me and a few of my friends to work. As the information age moved from dawn to the full light of day, technology horizons were constantly shifting, revealing a brave and exciting world of new possibilities and new opportunities. Oracle doubled in size year after year after year for 10 years. I had set out to create the perfect programming job for me. Instead, I created a job where I had to stop programming altogether. I attempted to create an environment that I could completely control. Instead, I was running a company with thousands and thousands of people that was growing so fast that it was impossible for anyone to control. It was like sailing in a hurricane. And then we went public. Oh my God. Maybe I should have been a doctor. <laughs> I was constantly learning, on-the-job training, I think they call it. Every day I learned something new and interesting, something that I did not know the day before. I like that. My new job was challenging, captivating, consuming. I worked all the time. But thinking back, I'm pretty sure I didn't love it. Or maybe I was just too tired to even know how I felt but I had found a place in the world. My family finally forgave me for not going to medical school. And nobody ever accused me of lacking ambition again.